Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage the visiting speaker series for Microsoft Research. Thanks for joining us in August. And I know this is probably like a given crowd, but I want to get this validation anyway. I would like to bring in more fiction writers to the series. How do we feel about that? Yes? Yay? Okay, good. Because I think stories are really are going to help us imagine ourselves in the next place. And not just, I mean, I love all the speakers we bring in, but I just think it's time for a little more fiction. Um, anyways, I probably don't have to go on and on to this crowd about Dune and, and the history of Dune and the original Dune and Frank Herbert. But I do want to say that, um, that today we are the very first event for Kevin and Brian for the Santa Words of Dune. This is the kickoff of their tour. And um, we're very lucky to have them here. As, as many of you know, um, this will be the end of that part of the the, of the saga, and they're going to talk a little bit about how they came to that and what that means. Um, along the way, not only do, have they been fulfilling their um, the contract and the outline of the Dune books, but they also, of course, have many, many written many books of their own that have won multiple awards. Um, Brian, of course, also wrote a wonderful biography of his father, and Kevin has more than 27 bestsellers with 11 million books in print worldwide. So they have been writing and writing some of our most loved books for years now, and I'm thrilled that we have them here on their very first event for their last book in the series. Actually, it's 45 bestsellers and 20 million books in print, but who's counting, you know? So. <laughs> she gets this old release version of the biography, I guess. Um, as, as Kim said, this is, this is our very first thing. The book just came out this morning. Um, this is the first time we've seen them in stacks on a, on a table here. Uh, Brian and I have not yet figured out what we're going to talk about, so this is like the beta release version of our, our talk. <laughs> See how I made that relevant to our audience? Um, Anyway, when I was flying up, I live in Colorado, and, and we always start out our dune tours here in Seattle because that's where Brian lives and uh, Frank Herbert spent so much time here. Uh, tonight we're signing at the University Bookstore, which is where we've started almost every one of our, our tours. Mm -hmm. um, and I was flying up just yesterday, and because it's so long and because I fly so often, I have gazillion frequent flyer miles, so sometimes I use them not to get free trips, because the last thing in the world that I want is a free trip after I travel, but I usually try to upgrade um, to first class so that I can sit with more elbow room and work on my laptop the whole time. And yesterday I was sitting next to um, a young guy, and he was totally silent, just sitting there reading his book the whole time. And that's the kind of people that I like to have sitting next to me, because I'm trying to work and got my iPod headphones on and I'm, I'm editing away. And I noticed that he was reading a science fiction book by David Drake. But he didn't say a word to me the whole time, and I was working on, on next year's Dune book, Paul of Dune, editing my chapters in it. And we finished, and when, when, when the plane was coming in for landing, I had to shut down the laptop. I pulled out my own science fiction book, and I was reading it. And as we got up to leave, the guy turns around, and he puts his hand out and says, I just wanted to say how nice it was to be sitting next to you the whole time. You're one of my favorite authors. I recognized you from a dust jacket picture, but I saw you were working on a Dune manuscript, so I didn't want to interrupt you, so I just was quiet the whole time. <laughs> wow. So that was a cool way to start out our, our tour, I think. But, um, and then this morning, I was sitting off at, man, I had to walk, I think, 15 or 20 steps to find a Starbucks from our our hotel room. Um, and I hold up there all morning and did some more editing. And then we're doing this for our social interaction time today. And then we'll probably go do some more editing this afternoon. But Well, and, and, and just to kick the trip off, Kevin handed me a, a t-shirt that's, that's been made on his last days of Krypton. I'm not wearing it today, but there's like a big S on it. And it's, it's very, very cool. So he's not going to be selling t-shirts yeah, here no. today either. Yeah. You told me you wear well, actually. It's, this is for a new book I have coming yeah. out in October called The Last Days of Krypton. I got yeah. to blow up Superman's planet. I, mm -hmm. My wife tells me I have a high celestial body count in my books because I keep blowing up planets. Well, well, Ke Kevin was a uh, uh, physics major, and he worked at Los Alamos and at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. And um, I'm a sociology guy out of Berkeley. so. Uh, there seems like there might be a disconnect there, uh, but our writing styles are very similar, and Kevin tends to write things that, that I don't, and I, I'm more interested in things that he's not as interested in. So, But we become interested in the various things that, that we've each done, so I think we're each learning from each other. And uh, 
It's been about 10 years now that uh, since I met Kevin, and we've had like one, like nine-minute argument. Seven minutes. Seven-minute argument. Yeah. See how uh, easily he just agrees to what I said. <laughs> He's and, learned. And, and then Kevin quickly apologized, and it was over. So, you know. <laughs> um, but it's it's been great. But it's uh, it's it's been a relationship definitely, and. Um, I've collaborated with other authors, and so has Kevin, and I collaborated on the last book that my father wrote, Man of Two Worlds, <clears throat> and that was quite different. Um, Dad was so busy that um, I, we, first we brainstormed it, and then I spent a, 13 months writing the first draft of the book, and then Dad got a hold of it, and he was very intense in like six months, and he got a lot of the things done, uh, but a lot of the humor in that book was my dad's. And people thought, well, since I had written satires before that, that the wacky stuff in Man of Two Worlds is Brian. Well, no, a lot of it was Frank Herbert. It's just that his sense of humor was not always coming out in, in the things he wrote. Um, and then I collaborated with an older woman on horror, horror novels, a couple of those that were published, and horror short stories. And the way Marie and I collaborated is uh, I would write a chapter, and then she would write the next one. So it was just like a leapfrog. But with Kevin, it's been a, more of a specialty. Kevin will write, say, the action scenes. He likes to blow things up, as he said. Um, and then I'll, since I'm into relationships and things, I'll then try to put it back together, you know, after the planet back together. But, but one of the amusing things was that when we first started writing, Kevin said, oh, what are we going to do? We can't write anything on the planet Dune. It's been destroyed. But I spent a year doing a concordance, and I, and I knew exactly on what page number everything was in this 600-page concordance. And I said, look, Kevin, it's a charred ball. We can still go back we to it. We can fix it. We can fix it, yeah. <laughs> we can rebuild it. It'll take six million dollars. We can rebuild it. Yeah. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our specialties on first draft. I'll do 55 chapters uh, that, I've, that we've agreed on, and he'll do 55. And then in this book, he's going to give me all his chapters, and I'll run through them. Uh, and then give it back to him. And then it goes back and forth, maybe seven to 11 iterations. Well, this, this book, Sandworms itself, is... Man, it's been a long time coming. I know you've all been waiting for it for a long time, and we've been waiting for it. It's um, when was Chapter House published? 1986. 86. 86. So mm -hmm. it's uh, 21 years that people have been waiting for the the next piece of the story. 85. Um, and it was like 1995 or something like that. I, I I had published a lot of Star Wars books. I had published a lot of my own books. I've been nominated for the Nebula Award and and the Bram Stoker Award, and and I also prove that I could work in other people's universes as well. Brian had uh, quite a track record of his own writing, writing his own novels, and of course, as, as he mentioned, he wrote the last novel with Frank Herbert, Man of Two Worlds. And after, I think, 10 years after Chapter House had been published and this Dune cliffhanger was left there, I couldn't figure out why this deadbeat hadn't finished up the story for so long. And, and uh, I was out hiking in Death Valley. I do my writing with a tape recorder while I'm out, out hiking. And I was out in the middle of the desert and I'd gotten lost on the trail and I'd finished dictating what it was I was planning to dictate and so I had several more miles to get back to my car that I hadn't planned on and as I'm out there in the middle of the desert I got to thinking of Dune for some reason and I was such a huge <laughs> Dune fan and I kept wondering what, what happened after Chapter House. There had to be something more after Chapter House because it was it was very clear this wasn't the end of the story. And um, after I came back from that, I, I just dropped Brian a letter kind of from out of the blue saying, are you, are you ever going to finish this up? Do you want to work together? Are we, um, can we consider doing this? Because it's, it's, it wouldn't be like, let's take Dune and, and just do an unnecessary sequel of it. This was something that we've been waiting for. So, um, so I pitched it to him and, and he called me up to talk about it, and my wife said in like two minutes we were talking another language. We were finishing each other's sentences, and we were mentioning esoteric things in some long out of print Frank Herbert novels, because I had read everything, and he had read everything, and we pretty quickly decided that we could work together and do something. Well, about the time that Kevin sent me the letter, um, I had agreed, and maybe 10 years went by after Dad died, and I had refused um, offers from other writers to collaborate. Um, and since I also managed the family business, I was not interested in having anyone else continue the series or, or do it myself. And some other writers, uh, well-known writers, approached me and wanted to collaborate. I just turned them all down. Um, but I finally agreed to edit a collection of new Dune short stories um, that was going to be edited by a, a, a well-known uh, East Coast editor. And, um, 
and one of the writers that was invited to write a Dune short story was Kevin J. Anderson. Well, that project never came to fruition, uh, but uh, Kevin said, well, I'd love to write the short story. I can't wait to, wait to do that, but I'd also be interested in writing a novel. And so uh, this was another step beyond where I wanted to be, I guess. Uh, so I took about a month, and I'm, I'm not really, I try not to, I'm a type A personality, but I try to be a nice one. So I wasn't trying to be rude, but I was like... He usually succeeds. Too. I was like procrastinating, and so I finally called him a month later, and that's when we, we hit it off, and we had this incredible energy. And um, that was January of 97. And when I finally met Kevin and his wife in May of 97, um, I was picked him up at the airport, and I almost drove the car off the road because I'm trying to find a notepad to write things down. We had so many ideas going and so much energy. And... Any of you that know Kevin or know about him know that he's got this tremendous amount of energy. He's like a dynamo. He's like, um, it's indescribable. But he went back after the brainstorming and he slept for how long? Two I mean, days. he was done, I mean, for two days because it's so intense. Um, but we came up with a lot of really incredible ideas and then we had to flesh them out and, and learn how to, how to work together. Well, just sort of in a, in a practical sense, obviously when we decided the first conversation was let's finish the story after Chapter House, because that was the part that, that was obviously that needed to be done. Um, but the more we started talking about it, just coming up with the, the grand finale of this thing 10 years after the original uh, Chapter House had been published was probably not the smartest thing to do. At, at that time, uh, all of Frank Herbert's other books were out of print except for the Dune novels, I think. Well, see, I, Kevin is very good at, at business and, and promotion, and, and I wanted to start with the Butlerian Jihad, but you, you were right. You said, let's start with the younger... Well, young, I, I yeah. mean, our first idea was to do mm -hmm. Hunters and Sandworms, although we didn't know that's what we were going to oh, call it. Yeah, it was, right. Our first idea was to do the, the end. Mm -hmm. But um, after talking to lots of people and, and seeing other Dune fans, and, and of course Brian has the numbers because he gets the, the royalty statements and things, Everybody read Dune. It's the best-selling science fiction book of all time. I've, I've seen numbers like 20 million copies in print or something. I, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but um, everybody read Dune, and then most people read through Children of Dune, and then a lot of people kind of didn't understand God Emperor, or it wasn't what they were looking for, and then, and then people trailed off a little bit more with uh, Heretics and Chapter House. And so we felt by just jumping right in at the, at the tail end of that uh, without... Doing, doing something to reawaken the spotlight of, of interest, it, was, um, it would have been better if we had gotten people talking about Dune again. And as Brian mentioned, his idea, and you had talked with, with your father about it, about doing stories about the Balearian Jihad, the 10,000 years before Dune, and, and the whole war with the thinking machines. The only problem with starting with that is that it was a Dune book, but it didn't have any characters you knew in it, because it was so far behind. And finally, um, we were talking, I think my wife might have suggested, I don't know which, which it was, but the idea came up about doing an immediate prequel, telling the love story of Duke Leto and Lady Jessica and the battles with the Baron Harkonnen and the planetologist on, on Dune and how the, the old emperor is assassinated by his own son Shaddam. And that seemed like a really cool story and it had all the characters people were familiar with, uh, would lead right into Dune. And so that's what we decided to do with our first thing, House. House Atreides and then House Harkonnen and House Carino. Um, House Atreides, well, we sent in the proposal. It was like a 95-page proposal or some huge... Oh, oh contrary. It was the longest proposal apparently in the history of New York that was actually read by, edit, by the editors. It was 141 pages. <laughs> well, 50 of those were unnecessary. I was, that's what I was thinking of the 90-some pages. Anyway, we had, we had a bunch of publishers bidding on it and we sold... Um, we've heard it was like the largest single contract in science fiction in publishing. So we, we got a really good deal on, on it, and it came out, House of Traders came out, and it sold three times what the publisher expected it to be. There were a lot of people skeptical whether we could pull it off or not. Um, I mean, I did have a beard, and his last name is Frank is Herbert, so we thought maybe between the two of us we could try to be Frank Herbert. But, um, and it sold like crazy, and it was published by Bantam Books, and ironically, Tom Doherty, who's the publisher of Tor Books, uh, he didn't even bid on House Atreides because he knew Frank Herbert and had worked with Frank Herbert and just was not, he was sure we couldn't pull it off. And he read House Atreides and he called our agent, went out to lunch, and he said, 
I've just read this book and I have to have the next Dune books. I don't care what it takes because I want to do the next Dune books. Now, if you're an agent, that's exactly what you want a publisher to be telling you. Um, and it turned out we did go with him for the next trilogy, the Butlerian Jihad books, and then uh, with The Road to Dune, and now Hunters and Sandworms, and we've got, got more coming up. But um, those three books did really well. The Butlerian Jihad trilogy has done wonderfully well. Hunters of Dune hit number three in the New York Times bestseller list, um, and we hope you buy many more copies so that we can do better than number three on this one. But, um, but we decided to start out House of Atreides by saying that the Baron Harkonnen was lean and muscular. And uh, that, well, that's going to be what, what you call kind of a narrative hook in a sense. And But a lot of readers looked at that and said, these guys don't know what they're talking about. The Baron Harkonnen, and it should be Harkonnen. Some people only read the first sentence and complained about it on Amazon. Well, the, then they think from the movie that it should be Harkonnen, but it's really, I've listened to Dad do his readings and it was Harkonnen. But, yeah, so we set him up as lean and muscular, and then we explain how he got the way he did. So it's, it's like wheels within wheels in a, in a scheme there. So that was just one of the wild ideas that, that we had when we first started brainstorming. Well, and we, we had so many, <coughs> we haven't finished, finished the story yet. So when we, when we plotted out House Atreides and we started doing some interesting things with it, it was very shortly after that that uh, Brian received a call from a, a state attorney. And I'll let you tell that. Yeah, uh, it was 1997, May of 97. It was two weeks after I met Kevin and his wife. And um, the estate attorney, his name is Walt Tabler, and he's an attorney in Seattle. And he said to me, Brian, what do you want to do with these two safety deposit boxes uh, that were your father's? And I, I was totally clueless. I, well, I, the estate was still open. So I thought, well, maybe there's some jewelry and things like that. So I went down with another estate attorney named Jan Cunningham. And Jan and I, uh, she, it, there was no keys, so it had to be like drilled into. There was two boxes in Bellevue. And drill them open, get them open, and they're there. And she starts scribbling down what's in there. And it's like computer disks and printouts of recipes, letters, and then a, a, an old-style floppy disk with my dad's handwriting on it. And it says, Dune 7 Notes. And these are notes I didn't even know they existed. Um, it was incredible. And there was a 30 or 35-page printout there with it. Um, and then after that, I, uh, I got that back. I took it to a national security expert, retired guy, who actually went into the disk and ensured me there was nothing more in there that, uh, that wasn't on the printout. So it all matched up. And um, then I went home and started going through old boxes up in my attic. And there's like almost 1,500 pages of, of additional notes. Now, they were not plot notes, but they would be scenes that had been deleted from, from Dune by Dad. Um, various character development things. So Kevin and I had more than a thousand pages to work with, plus this concordance that I spent a year doing. So we know exactly all the characters' colors and their eye colors and et cetera, and their and their history. Um, and then we we feel like we did our homework before we took on this project. Well, and some of those notes and chapters and deleted things uh, were published in the Road to Dune uh, two years ago, and it was sort of like the. We think of it as the Silmarillion in Dune, because the Silmarillion was just a whole bunch of pieces that Tolkien never never published. Um, and it's come out, this is, Hunters of Dune is our eighth Dune novel, ninth actual Dune book. Uh, we've gotten, over the past decade, we've gotten thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, uh, both emails and, and fan letters, and we, we keep them in the little separate folders. And yes, there are some people who complain they don't think we should have done it, but uh, we have a 96% approval rate, and, and we like to well, that's, gone that's a down. little bit better than, than George Bush. Well, well that's gone down because I've been telling people it was 97, so we have a little slippage there. <laughs> 96.5, I guess. <laughs> but uh, Sandworms of Dune is the, the grand climax. It's the, the end to all these books that Frank Herbert had outlined. Um, we, we realized that after 20-some years of waiting for this book that there's probably nothing we could do that could meet everybody's expectations, but we really threw everything we could into it while keeping true to Frank Herbert's original outline and his, his plan for the book. And what we're working on right now, uh, I just finished writing my 55 chapters in it about two days ago. Brian's got maybe another week to, to catch up on it. but. Uh, the next book is called Paul of Dune, which is uh, sort of the, the sandwich, Brian calls it, that goes right before Dune and right after Dune. So a Dune Witch. A Dune Witch. <laughs> yeah, Dunwich. It was, no, that was H.P. Lovecraft. Um, <coughs> it's the story of young, young Paul Atreides and his father, uh, Duke Leto's War of Assassins, that, that's all mentioned in Dune. It's, that takes place before the novel. Uh, and then 
we have the story between Dune and Dune Messiah, where at the end of Dune, Paul's about to launch his Fremen on this huge galactic spanning jihad where they're going to take over thousands of planets. And then Dune Messiah opens up with, and after that's all done with, well, let's settle down and deal with the politics. So we thought we wanted to blow up more planets and do the whole battle in the middle well, of it. Well, Dune Messiah is, um, was the most disappointing, supposedly disappointing novel, according to the fans initially, that, that Frank Herbert wrote. Because he took this, this incredible story of Paul Atreides and this wonderful hero that everyone identified with, and then he flipped it over. And so you've got, by the time Dune Messiah starts, there's it's been 12 years and billions of people have been killed in his name, which sounds like a, you know, there could be religious parallels there, which there are. Um, but Dad was, was issuing a warning, which science fiction writers tend to do, and the warning was be careful about following charismatic leaders. Um, and I've you know, I, I'm careful about getting going into business with people that are too charismatic too, because excuse me, <laughs> I was it was intentional. <laughs> but they can be they can charm you out of your socks basically, and and a leader can do that. And and if a leader does it with millions of people following him, uh, that can be really be dangerous. And so there's all kinds of parallels that I could mention, but the one that that Dad mentioned most often was was John F. Kennedy, who was not that bad a guy according to Dad, but he was so charismatic that we would have done anything for him. And so his warning in Dune Messiah was to be careful of people like that and, and governments lie, which has been, been proven since then. Um, so his, his, that was just meant one of the many warnings that, that Frank Herbert had. Um, going back earlier, Dad had invented containerized shipping in the Dragon in the Sea. So he was, he was way ahead of his time. Uh, as far as a lot of these things go. And in fact, his warnings about uh, the dangers of thinking machines, well, a lot of the people have, uh, have done movies on these and they, they say, well, you, you, you guys are just copying from so-and-so, Schwarzenegger or something. Well, no, Frank Herbert warned about these things in the early 1960s. And he started writing that book in 1958. Yeah, we got a, a review on the Butler and Jihad with this comment that these guys are just copying the Terminator movies. Mm -hmm. um, excuse me, Frank Herbert did it like 20 years before the Terminator movies, so mm -hmm. get your facts straight. Uh, now we tend to kind of talk on too much, so uh, maybe we could take some, do some questions? Or? Well, I had one beforehand that okay. I want to address. Okay. Somebody asked about our, yeah. our writing style, and I know okay. that you can talk about, about yours because I'm not, you hold up in your office and do your stuff. I do most of my writing with uh, a tape recorder. I'll go out hiking all the time. Uh, that way I get to go and go off hiking in the Rocky Mountains and tell everybody, don't bother me, I'm working. Um, I do mountain climbing and do the Colorado Trail, and I'll just tell myself the story, and I find that that's the best way that I can get things done. And I, I have now, I won't go into details, but I have finally, finally gone digital on my tape recorder. It took me years to find some uh, a digital tape recorder that would actually work, because the other ones that, that I've tried, and I must have wasted hundreds of dollars on buying one after another after another, that they, they just they didn't work for dictating stories. It was like it, it closed off the file every time you paused it, and, and there were lots of reasons. But finally, I've got one that works, and so now I email my files off to a typist in L.A. who types them and then emails them back, and it's much better than what she calls the coal-burning microcassette tapes that she was used to be used to be transcribing for me. Um, so that's how I can be fairly prolific. I'll just go off and I'll hike 14, 15 miles, and I'll come back. Because after you've hiked seven or eight miles away from your car, you've got seven or eight miles that you have to hike back to your car. So I can do another four or five chapters when I'm when I'm walking on my way back. I do it more the old-fashioned way. My my word processor for many years was a number two pencil until I was dragged kicking and screaming. I guess 1987 I got my first Macintosh. Um, now I do type it out, but I I do I, w on first draft. Uh, I'm I've written 40 something chapters of the new book, and so. Probably 90,000 words uh, I've written in 40 days. So I, I go a pretty good pace, too, of my own. Um, the first two books in the series, I actually was faster than Kevin, but I hurt myself trying to keep up with him. And so it was, there was a competition there, though. Uh, which chapter are you on? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brian, Brian is really, really a good collaborator for me. He's one of the only guys that I know that works as hard as, as, hard as I do. And, and I'm not being snide by that. I, I have collaborated with other people, and I find out that I end up writing three quarters of the book just because the other person's so far behind. But, but even beyond that, just real quickly, we're, we're not going to continue the Dune series forever. We, this is the chronological grand finale. We've read Paula Dune after that and a few other novels, but we, we don't want it to, we want to go out on a high note. So we're, we're not going to just drag this on. So um, uh, 
you know, we could be talked into things, we could come up with new ideas, so, so I'll be a little flexible on that comment, but I just can't visualize, you know, forever, you know, writing Dune books. Well, I mean, the yeah. thing is that it says Dune on the cover. I mean, you might have noticed it's big letters on the cover, yeah, and that's yeah. that's some um, big footsteps to, yeah. to fill, or big shoes to fill, and... I mean, sure, we could keep writing adventure stories and set on a desert planet, but it's got to be worth a story worthy of having the word Dune on it, and uh, we have to keep pushing ourselves. In fact, we're doing that even now, arguing back and forth about, no, we've got to make this bigger or more important or make it relevant to this. It's um, mm -hmm. I, Because we're fans, too, and we read a lot, and we've noticed times where it seems like the author's kind of just phoning it in, and we don't want that to happen with us. We want to really keep doing the, the real stuff. And then if you if you like the Dune series, the, the way um, we have approached it, Kevin has his own series, the Seven Sun series, and I have Time Web. They're both uh, separate science fiction series. And we have a lot of other projects. Kevin has his last days of Krypton, which has a movie. Will it have a movie tie-in eventually? Or yeah. maybe? Or a comic? Hope. Comic tie-in? Comic tie-in. Comic tie-in, tie okay. Um, <clears throat> but we, and what we said about the Dune books, we're talking about doing our own original series. That mm -hmm. as we work obviously well enough together that we'd like to do something of our own. Mm -hmm. um, we'll keep busy for another year or two, I think. So, <laughs> so yes. I'm, I'm sure in your collaboration you have edited each other. Oh, yeah. But I also assume you have an editor um, at the publishing mm -hmm. house. And it'd be, I mean, how that editor would have to know so much about the Dune world and the Dune history and the Dune characters. Are very, you know, how did you have that work? Well, Pat Labruto is, is our editor. He's a big picture kind of guy. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't want to do all the little minutia of, of the syntax. But his, his big picture comments are wonderful, and he's very detailed in the last comments he gave to us on, on Paul of Dune. Uh, but uh, Pat has just been a Dune fan. He knew my dad, and uh, so it's, it's been ideal. In fact, he, he was our editor at Bantam, and one of the conditions that we made when we went over to Tor is we want Pat Labruto. So, so he's a freelance editor, and we still have him. He claimed that he started working in the mailroom at Ace Books, and the first book he ever stole was a paperback copy of Frank <laughs> Herbert's Dune from that book. <laughs> um, and also our British editor, Carolyn Cahey, who uh, has been the editor on every one of, of the books, um, she was Frank Herbert's editor. She edited Heretics and Chapter House and the British editions of it. So, I mean, we've got a, a fairly long tradition here. And in fact, I have a book out that uh, I'll, I'll give some posters out at our signing, a book called Slan Hunter, which is the the completion of A.E. Van Vogt's last novel, the sequel to his book, Slan. Uh, my editor on that one is David Hartwell, who was the editor of Children of Dune, and the guy who made that the first New York Times best-selling science fiction novel ever. So mm -hmm. we're, we're working with a lot of old editors. But plus, we, we edit each other's work a lot, but we don't do it with a red pen. We, we kind of hide it in the computer files that go back and forth. Um, but, but the first, very first time I got uh, an, an edited version back from Kevin of House Atreides, he had deleted one of my really cool chapters that I wrote. So I remember a little debate about that. And I, got, I think I got like half my chapter back. <laughs> well, the, the way we do it, though, is that we do ship the, the computer file back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I just edit it online and send mm -hmm. it back to him. We don't mm -hmm. ever do the, the school teacher correcting papers mm -hmm. thing with mm -hmm. the red pencils and mark mm -hmm. things up. I, because it just, mm -hmm. that's asking for... for trouble. You don't mm. want him to look at every word that I no. change, and I don't want to look at every word he changed, because I trust what he's doing, and I hope he trusts what I'm doing, and you just work until you both are happy with it. Plus, we alternately send the finished product to the publisher, so sometimes Kevin will send it out at the last, and I do too. So that was a good question. Um, any other? Uh, John? Yeah. Yeah, how do you deal with plotting? I'm sorry, what was that? How do you deal with plotting? Very well. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think somebody counted uh, Dune House Atreides has eight storylines, and Kevin will take four of those, and I'll take four of those. And then we uh, lay out uh, what we think would be the really neat scenes, the high-impact scenes, um, and we've got them laid out on a piece of paper or on note cards. Initially, they were note cards, and we'd, we'd scatter these note cards on the floor in varying colors, one color for each plot line. Now we do that on the computer with colors. But we can recognize instantly if a particular plot line is deficient. So insert Duke Leto plot line here. And then the, the thing, the challenge there is we need a Duke Leto scene, but it can't be just like insert Duke Leto here. So um, but the, the plotting is tricky. And it, I mean, it, it's almost like putting a puzzle together. You put mm -hmm. the, either on, on screen, you do like change the color of the, the text to blue or to red or whatever, just so you can look down and see the, um, the, the visual arrangement of the colors, but also 
uh, what we do, even though we live halfway across the country from each other, we'll get together at least once a year. We'll just hang out for days and we just brainstorm the whole time and jot down these ideas for chapters and lay them out and, and try to get them uh, going. And then we flush it out into a detailed outline and and we split the chapters in half. He literally does half as, half the chapters and I do half the chapters. and And then we rewrite each other. And during the plotting we decide um, whose point of view we should be in, which which point of view character we should be in, and you kind of want to keep that to a minimum. You don't want too many points of view that scatter people. And you want to end chapters on suspense, which is one of the things my dad taught me. So you, you try to do that. sandworm lunged. As, as much as you can, and then you come back to what happened when the sandworm lunged over somebody. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and I think it was during that lull, uh, this book came out called Dune Encyclopedia, which I I loved it. It was a lot of neat ideas. 1984. It, it, it seemed to not correlate all that well with the, the resurgence of the stories and, and going back into the prehistory. Um, how did that book come about and why is it different? Well, that that book was, uh, the guy's name was, was Willis McNelly, and he was basically a, a very dedicated Dune fan who asked, uh, the, the specific, he asked Frank Herbert if he could write this Dune Encyclopedia, and Frank Herbert gave him permission to do so, and even wrote the introduction to it, and said, this is interesting stuff, but it's not really uh, the canon of what my ideas were. Um, we had the thousands of pages of Frank Herbert's notes and his outlines. Uh, we aren't even sure if Frank Herbert even read McNelly's encyclopedia, but but that's that's sort of a fan thing, and it's not copyrighted by the Frank Herbert estate or anything. It's it's a it, it's not meant to be tied into everything else. Ours I'll, are all tied I'll, in. Although I'll else. I'll say fans can't really do that without written permission. Yeah, this yeah, this was yeah. back at a time they didn't mm. pay that close of attention to that, I guess. But the, <clears> and there have been fans that are are screaming and wailing that our books don't match the McNally's encyclopedia. I mean, okay, well, that doesn't, it's not supposed to. Well, there's it's even been, the, uh, timelines have been put on the internet with McNally's timeline. Well, that's nothing to do with, with Dune, but it, it's good to think, I mean, it has to do with Dune, but but it's good to think of that and, and think of Spice Planet, the, the separate book that Kevin and I put together. There's a novel, uh, there, there's a novel in there called Spice Planet, but it's in The Road to Dune, which I see some of you have here. Well, Spice Planet is an alternate Dune story too. It's it's a, a different version of what of, of of the story we've all come to love. But Dad started with a magazine article, then he went to the Spice Planet concept. We found Dad's notes and we wrote Spice Planet later. But then he went to Dune as it got more complex. So there's probably fifty thousand different ways Dune could have come out. <laughs> okay. What's it for Kevin? What Herbert like? For well, me, you'd have to ask Brian because I never met you him. Never met him. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, well, I, I wanted to meet him. I had his home address. He inspired all kinds of stuff from me. And my my first book was published. I was ready to send him my first autographed copy of my my very first novel. And he died like a month or two before it came out. So I I never got to. Well, I I, I knew him for 38 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the the first 20 years were difficult. I mean, he was very uh, authoritarian. Um, his study, the whole house had to be quiet. I tiptoed around the house. And, um, but his, you know, it, it was the 1950s type of discipline. Um, so I got to put it in context. Uh, yeah, I was disciplined, but so was he. By his, his father out of the 30s actually was a cop. So um, I, it, it wasn't so bad when you put it in context, but I didn't bond with him uh, until I was in my 20s. And um, my mother got terminal lung cancer when, um, I was in my mid-twenties and she was expected to live only a few months and then I saw my dad shift, it seemed to shift into another gear. I always knew they were incredibly close. But he sacrificed himself for her, he built this incredible house he really couldn't afford for her in Maui. Um, and he became her nurse, her maid, her cook. Um, and I saw this other side to this man um, and I wrote about this in Dreamer of Dune, the biography. But, um, so buy that to get the full answer to your question. <laughs> but, but ultimately, he was complex. You, you look at Dune, it's an adventure story, but look at all the layers beneath it. That was Frank Herbert, too. And to get to those layers wasn't easy for me as a son, but um, it was incredible to me that he and I, for 12 years, as, and when I was an adult, he was my best friend, and I felt like it was the reverse. So I, I was able to, to have, have that wonderful relationship with him, but it was a long time coming. <laughs> 
So a lot of people have um, estranged relationships with, with siblings or, or parents and this and that. So that's a lot of what I wrote about in the biography is, is my changing relationship with him. <clears throat> I know somebody had a hand up. Yeah. Do you find while you're writing that at times the storyline takes turns that you weren't expecting or goes in directions that you never would have imagined? Oh, or yeah. Erasmus, maybe, as a character? Oh, well, the, the, the character of, e, of Erasmus in the Butler and Jihad books was... I mean, we knew what the character was, and we knew it was, uh, it's a, basically a, a robot who wants to be human, but he's sort of a cross between Dr. Mengele and Pinocchio, I think. Um, and we had the story, and we were writing the story, but this guy became way more interesting than we had originally started out with him. And he's, in fact, mm -hmm. I think he's one of our favorite characters in the whole. I think he started out as Kevin's idea that, that he was a robot that wanted to understand music and various things. Well, in a sense, that's sort of like a, a vampire wanting to be human. So it's a it's a familiar thing, and then I then I think it was my assignment to or my we had a mutual choice that I'd write the first draft on that, and I said to Kevin, maybe I'm going to make him like Dr. Mengele and add in all this weird stuff. So then I added all this really strange stuff, and then Kevin got a hold of it and made him even more uh, intriguing. So. Well, there are times that he's and he's told me this on some of the Paula Dune stuff. He's, he'll send me the chapters and he'll go. Wait until you read this. I've got a nasty surprise in there for you. So I don't know what he's going to put in some of these. Well, I've forgotten which story it was. Uh, maybe it was. Uh, it was hunting Harkonnens. But but, but the, there was a story where we had um, we, we stranded our, our our characters on a on a on a ship on a highliner at an outer space. They're stranded, and so I, I think I came up maybe came up with that original idea. And then I sent the outline back to Kevin. I said, Now, Kevin, get them out of of this. So they're stranded in outer space. So my chapter was, Kevin gets them out of this mess. But the I navigator is dead, or he's dying. How do you get him out of this? You know? <laughs> um, Hus Carino, I think that's what yeah, yeah. But it's good to be challenged. You don't want to... I mean, it's, it's kind of... You don't want to do a book where you just know everything. I look at the outline as, as a road map. If you're going to take a trip across the country, you want to have the map and you know where you're going. But you want to have room so that when you're driving, physically driving along, you can actually stop to see the world's largest ball of string or the Spam Museum or things like that that you weren't necessarily planning when you looked at the map. And it comes up when you're driving along and you see interesting things and want to do side trips. Yeah. What you just said now, there's a ton of details in the book, every small language which you have to go to great lengths to keep consistent with what you are coming up with. <laughs> how, how do you manage that? Well, you know, it, it's amazing. I leave it to Brian. Well, if, if, if you look at the million words that Dad wrote in the series, um, and he didn't do it with computers, and somehow he kept track of all of it, well, that's genius. Fortunately, we've got computers now, but um, I'll, I'll just say there's 2,500,000 words, I think, that have been published now in, the, in this uh, canon of Dune. Um, so it's hard to keep track of it, even even with computers. So um, I'll just say that we are human. We're not computers. You know, it's the human advantage, but there's also disadvantages to it. So there can be little things that we have to work our way out of. <laughs> well, and, and he and I go over it 10 to 13 times, mm -hmm. and we have things like four or five mm -hmm. test readers who have various areas of expertise, and they'll maybe catch something. And then the editors will go on it, and then the the copy editors, they're, they're like the, the real anal retentive ones that don't have any real lives, and they sit there and they look at everything. And, and you know, when it gets published and you still get letters from the fans going, well, this misses this part and it doesn't connect well, and then we have to write another book to explain why that really wasn't a mistake <laughs> after all. And but, but, but Kevin has the great answer. You ask, I'm sure maybe a question like that will come yeah. up today, well, why did you do this? And Kevin will say, well, that will be explained in a future in book. In a future book, yes. <laughs> But that was, he was winging it on that one. <laughs> well, um, but we've also, I, I mean, I'm reading Children of Dune again right now, and I think it's like my seventh time reading mm -hmm. that book. Um, and the more we study these things, and we go over and over and over and over them, um, yeah, we found a couple of little inconsistencies that Frank Herbert left in there. And in fact, finding those inconsistencies makes me admire even more how tiny the inconsistencies are and how, how well he managed to um, keep everything completely in order when he wrote through them. But, you know, they're, they're books. They're, they're works of fiction. They're things that, that Frank Herbert did or that Brian and I are doing. And um, they're, they're like a, an antique. You want to have little 
well, you don't want to have the little imperfections in it, but if it does, it makes it more valuable. Well, you know, well one of the fun things is to go back with Dune in particular and read it not just as an adventure story, but read it, read it for the philosophy, the religion, the ecology, the politics. Read one of those layers. And Dad set it up intentionally so, and he said to me that when, they, when people come out of Dune, when the reader comes out of Dune, I want them to have fragments of it. I want detritus of that story still clinging to that reader after they come out. Um, so one of the things you can do is, is read through it and look for inconsistencies. <laughs> um, and I found that the age of Shaddam Carino is inconsistent in there, the emperor. It's, you look at the appendix, you look at the epigraphs in the beginning, there's an inconsistency. And so I was writing an afterword for the 40th anniversary of Dune. I was asked, do you want to correct these things? And I said, no, I, I don't want to change a word, <laughs> nor should I. <clears throat> well, and there are just little, I just reread Dune Messiah again. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, and I don't even call these inconsistency, there, there are a lot of um, typos or, or, or typographical inconsistencies on the way Muad'Dib is spelled or on the, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a Hagal Emerald or a Hagar Emerald. And, and, you know, at some point, maybe if the book is retypeset, we might want to correct those. But I don't want to change any of the words. I, I mean, want to correct the obvious misspellings and things. But... And, and we, d we do have a glitch in one of our stories. I won't say what it is, but now Kevin and I have to fix it in the current, current book. So. <laughs> well, and there's... It's minor, though. There is a... Um, well, we can mention we've done it. When Frank Herbert himself was writing the books, he's got Gurney... Gurney Halleck had a beloved young sister who was killed by the Harkonnens, and he hates the Harkonnens for it. And then when he wrote God Emperor of Dune... He's got Duncan Idaho, who mentions he's got a beloved sister who was killed by the Harkonnens, and he hated the Harkonnens for it. And I think Frank Herbert even ad admitted in his own life that, oops, he just got the characters mixed up. Um, so we had to sort of fix that by showing in House Harkonnen, we show Gurney and his sister and, and everything. And then Duncan Idaho, we had to mention that Duncan and his, his family was killed. And you can just add a sister in there if you want, because his family was, was killed in it. And, well, for, 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 every, for every one of my dad's errors that we fix, we fix about ten of our own. That <laughs> <laughs> is, um, clearly because your father came from his era and his time, his religious background, you know, all that mm -hmm. political experience. And you, you guys are writing in a whole different world and a different time and mm -hmm. different technology and all that. Do you think it's kind of the flavor of how characters would move about the world and the decisions they would make? Well, oh, yeah. it, it, it's, it's changed the, the way we, we plot and pace these books. I mean, we're, we're not writing... If you look at the last couple of books that Dad wrote, there's a lot of talking going on, a lot of philosophy, and in the background, a, an important character was killed or Dune was destroyed. But we have set up more of a template where we look at Dune and it's got all the layers of action and all the inter other interesting things, so we try to do that. Um, but as far as the, 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 the politics, the modern politics, well, it's, it's obvious. I mean, there's so many parallels with the Middle East and, and bin Laden. And, and, gee, could bin Laden in, in the Dune scenario be the good guy? So we, we're having to deal with a lot of these things to think through. Well, and just the way that we, <clears throat> we never, ever tried to copy Frank Herbert's writing style when mm -hmm. we were doing it. I mean, we're, that's just crazy to try to copy somebody else's style. We write the way we write. Um, because we're writing in, it's now 2007, and Frank Herbert wrote the original Dune book in, in 58, 59, 60, something like that. I mean, it's a whole different world. It's like you pick up a, a Charles Dickens novel, his prose is different. So our prose is more, um, I like to call it more transparent. We have more um, color, visual. I, I like to see things in my head when I'm writing. I like to see the... Um, the big scene on the movie screen almost in, in your imagination um, and Frank Herbert did a lot more of the um, going off on a tangent and he'll he'll analyze some philosophical thing and I'll well uh, he wasn't interested in the dis he, he, the, the destruction of Arrakis is important but he has it in the background so Kevin and I decided we wanted to actually write that scene so he wrote it as a backstory and and so there's a character actually describing first what chapter in Hunters of Dune what so. it was like so that's more the difference in the two styles other than Dune, which we we think he's got it all mixed and balanced there, but Dad could that Dad could continue. To, he 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 was exploring the layers that he'd set out in Dune, and he could explore those layers and go into all that. So, but I don't think people would have the patience for that now to do that. Well, I mean, these uh, one more question. Okay. Um, yeah, it kind of falls in her question, but let me start from my question first and go to her. <laughs> 
Um, I'll be the first to admit I haven't actually, I'm actually on Heretics of Dune right now, so I haven't actually, and I love the storyline. It's actually taken me years to read mm -hmm. Dune because I'm the kind of guy that analyzes each page and I have to go back and reread what was just said, the details, right? Mm -hmm. and, We're going to get a letter from him, I'm sure. Sorry? <laughs> We're going to get a letter from you sooner no, or later. No, not at all, not at all. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's actually a compliment because one of the things I appreciate about the stories is I was recently on a honeymoon and I just had to ask my, my, my new wife, you know, if I could have permission to finish God Emperor of Dune, right? And so mm -hmm. I actually finished God Emperor of Dune because you know, I was on my honeymoon and I had the book with me, right? So I finally got to finish it. And I started Heretics of Dune. And mm -hmm. the refreshing thing about Heretics of Dune is a little forward by Frank Herbert where he explains why he's writing the books, right? It's kind of like re a reality check, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't a new religion. It's not a new philosophy. Right. It's just him explaining his views on life and the parallels between Right. Middle East conflicts of his time, the oil embargoes, and all other things that happened while he was writing original books. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with that in mind, I guess I lost the question. But what I wanted to ask was, what is his? What was his religious background? She kind of mentioned it, but I never actually heard about. Well, uh, as I'm philosophical as, religious. as I mentioned, my grandfather was a, a cop. He was a highway patrolman, and all this and that. Um, but um, um, he was married to a woman who was uh, Irish Catholic, and there were probably she had eleven or twelve sisters. And so all these Irish Catholic aunts that my dad had tried to force Catholicism on him, and dad quickly rebelled against that. And, and my mom had a similar situation when she was a child where it was the Pentecostalists where they tried to force that on her. So both of them came into the marriage not wanting any religion. And in fact, I remember uh, when we lived in Portland, I would go to a Protestant church by myself because I wanted to go over and, and see what was going on over there. But there had been none of that in, in my family. But my father was, um, they were both very religious, so my parents were religious in their own way, spiritual. But my dad described himself to me once as, as a Buddhist, basically, uh, but not a practicing one. Um, and uh, he was also a Republican. He was a Republican speechwriter, and he was an anti-war leader. Um, <laughs> um, so... Uh, and I remember, a man of contradictions. But, but I remember being, I was raised as a Republican kid, so I tended to kind of be Republican, although I'm more liberal on a lot of things. But, uh, but Dad was this complex guy. And so when, when people ask me what my political views are, I, I say, well, they're kind of complex and nuanced, but not as complex as, as my dad. So his political, his religion, all this stuff was all enmeshed. Um, the character that he most developed, uh, identified with in the Dune series, uh, you can guess a lot. I mean, I, I tend to see him as Duke Leto, but he just, he told me that it's Stilgar that he identifies the most with. So Stilgar has this Native American type of view of, of the earth and, and the simplicity of life. Well, Dad, as a child, uh, since my grandparents were alcoholics, Dad was often out uh, on his own in a rowboat or whatever on Puget Sound, and he met some Native Americans, and they would teach him how to fish and the, the philosophy of life. So I think uh, his philosophy of life was that it, it was it, there's there's something of, of that's spiritual in all all living things, uh, but then he has some Buddhism in there and maybe a little Christianity and complex guy. And again, you can read more about him, Dreamer of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to plug that. <laughs> but, well, but, I noticed they got copies for sale, so I have to do. do but that but so. you know, a lot of these questions about about how these books are put together or about Frank Herbert, there really aren't simple answers, and so. I mean, I can I can spin off for ten minutes on a question and then realize, oops, I've gone too far. Kind of like you lost track of your question. I I do it all the time. <laughs> well, I can just see the the news story in a couple of years that the next release of Microsoft Windows was delayed because all the important people were here watching us talk all afternoon. So, um, okay, I think we're. How are we going to set up the book um, signing thing? Okay. More light area. And so, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.